uh, turn to equities now, uh, bring in Chris Conway from the Australian Stock Report to see how the market is tracking ahead of this rates decision. So we're seeing a lot of pressure on the banks today, Chris. Uh, is it anticipa in anticipation of any commentary coming from the RBA or what's really pulling those big four down? Good afternoon, Nadine. Look, I'm not making too much of today's action. Um, haven't really focused on the banks, to be perfectly honest, so I can't answer your specific question. But more broadly, I think what today is a symptom of is no positive leads, of course, from the US. So just thinking about how our reporting season, as it was winding down, US markets sort of started turning higher once more and, and hitting fresh all-time highs. And that was enough of a catalyst to at least keep our market where it was and even push it a little bit higher. Um, but it seems that the narrative post-reporting season is, you know, that the market is full, looking full, valuations are full. And just about everyone on the show that I was watching this morning is talking about, you know, the possibility of the market rolling over a little bit. Look, as you know, I'm a trader. I come from a slightly different perspective, and that perspective is, is you keep riding the market until it kicks you off. And provided U.S. markets continue to move higher, which is, you know, again, a big if, what with the trade wars and the escalating tensions between the U.S. and China. But if U.S. markets can continue higher, I think that's where we take our lead from. That becomes the new narrative, and I think the Aussie market can, can push higher. Chris, Chris Kohler here from the desk. Uh, look, you saw some further upside in Borrell despite the fact that they, their stock jumped on, uh, on reporting day. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so certainly Borrell was uh, a victim of uh, some concerns that had come out of the headwater acquisition and more specifically the fly ash uh, segment of that business. Fly ash, of course, being the ingredient that goes into hardening concrete and it comes from the, the refuse or the burning of coal and, uh, and from coal plants. The, the, the worry being, of course, that you know, we're winding down coal burning around the globe and there won't be as much of this fly ash. But there's, I think, about a billion tonnes of it buried across the US alone, which they can dig up and, and extract this ingredient and continue to make a healthy profit from that division. So, yeah, there were some concerns. The stock sold off about 10% on these concerns a couple of months back. And we thought that was overdone. It's recovered all of that ground uh, with some strong results out of reporting season. But just from a valuation perspective, it still looks relatively cheap. It's trading at about a 12% discount to its historical PE. And its EPA, EPS sorry, consensus growth over the next three years, the profile is for about a 20% growth in earnings per share per annum. So if it gets a re-rating off the back of those metrics and those transitory factors that I was talking about with some of the concerns with headwaters and the fly ash, fly ash division pass, then we think we can see further share price appreciation. So we don't mind buying it, uh, aside from the fact, as I said, that it has recovered all of that sort of 10% and more ground that it lost uh, on, that, on that sort of downgrade. Although, I know you've been buying it lately, off by about 2% today to $6.98. So is this a good entry point if you're not in Boral already? I think uh, it went ex div today to the tune of 14 cents. Uh, yeah. So that's probably why it's off most of that. So, yeah, I mean, look, you're obviously not going to get that dividend now because today's the ex date and you've missed it. But, uh, yeah, you could, you could use that weakness, obviously, to uh, pick it up at a slightly cheaper price. All right, Chris, um, when it comes to some corporate news out today, we've got a Kogan founders selling down about $40 million worth of their holding in the company. Two ways to read this, the way the company is wanting you to, that this is part of the mat maturation of Kogan going forward. It's bringing liquidity, more liquidity into the shares. Um, or it's, um, yeah, it, it's something a little bit less uh, PR friendly. What do you make of it? Uh, it's a tough one, Nadine. I'm probably more on the sceptical side that it's, uh, that it's more a product of the fact that, let's face it, I don't mean anything, anything sinister by what I'm about to say, but the CFO and the CEO of a company, uh, you know, the guy who drives the strategy and the guy that controls the money are going to have the best insights, not only about the company, but also about the industry within that company operates. So they will have the best information. And again, I don't mean anything sinister by that. I'm not suggesting they're using inside information or doing anything untoward. But they have the best lay of the land. And you know, when they are selling down, not insignificant stakes and have done so previously, and that's also the kicker. They, they did it, I think it was last June as well. Um, you know, this seems to be a more systematic approach to selling down those stakes. And, you know, um, these guys are already very, very wealthy. I don't think it's because they want to buy the latest supercar or another mansion in Turak or anything like that. 
I think it's probably because they see some things that uh, concern them enough to continue that sell down. So I'm not surprised to see the stock falling by about the same amount as the uh, shares were offered at a discount yesterday. Yeah, Chris, really good to get your insight there on a stock that's down around 7.5% uh, today. Can we get some of your thoughts on the real winners out of reporting season, some of the likes of Altium or uh, Main Pharma? What did you make of them? Certainly. So, look, there were a lot of winners out of reporting season. We were fortunate enough to have quite a few. Um, some of the growth stories that really needed to report strong numbers did, and they've managed to kick higher, and Altium was certainly one of those. Uh, you know, they had about a 10% beat in terms of operating earnings, came in at 49.8. It was about 5 million, million over what consensus was. Um, their EBITDA margins uh, had been forecast to hit 35% um, and revenues of 200 million by 2020. This set of results, those EBITDA, EBITDA margins had already been achieved, so 35%, and that revenue target is likely to be hit next year as opposed to 2020. So they're already ahead of their own financial goals. The real kicker for me though, and this is the one that's important in the sense in that space, in that technology space, in that software space, the strong get stronger. And you know, we need to just look at social media um, to see how this can happen. So obviously there was MySpace that came along and seemingly had a good foothold in that market and then Facebook came in and totally obliterated them. And that's sort of what Altium is doing on a slightly smaller scale. They are becoming the go-to company for uh, software and chip making and chip design and they will hopefully supersede all their competitors who will become irrelevant. So that momentum will really just accelerate. So you've got a really strong financial picture, a company that is head of their own, uh, their own goals and like <coughs> I said in a space that they're likely to continue to dominate and continue to gain market share. So that's one that we think despite the huge share price appreciation, they really are in a good position to, uh, you know, to kick on. Okay. Um, before we have to let you go, Chris, back to the here and now. I mean, we do have these trade tensions weighing, as you mentioned off the top. We have hit a five-day low today. And so um, we're keeping an eye on that 62, 65, 50-day moving average. Um, we've got all sectors pretty much, except for the telcos, I think, last I checked, into the red. I mean, how, how is this market looking to you technically? Uh, well, certainly the, the very near-term momentum, as you say, the last sort of five sessions has been bearish, but there's a big support level at 62.30, which, you know, it isn't critical for that to hold in terms of the overarching bullish structure, for me at least, to remain intact on the ASX 200, but it would certainly be nice to see the bulls defend that region with some vigour. Um, but there are sort of multiple hor horizontal support levels below that, that level as well. So. Yeah, like I said, I think the, the overarching bullish structure remains intact. And I know there is this narrative, as I was saying earlier, about, you know, sort of everyone thinking the market is full, but the technical suggests otherwise. Um, and if we can hold that 62.30, then hopefully, you know, we sort of ricochet off it and, and, and run once more. So, you know, that's the risk point that I'd be looking at first up is 62.30. Well, Chris Conway, thank you very much for your insight. Ahead on trading day, the countdown 